working in an organisation for the disabled who wanted to make use of this flexible exception had to apply international law um, and ask whether, in fact, this use did comply. And, of course, we've got the expert on the three-step test sitting right here and knows that there's not exactly a lot of case law for these librarians and people working for these non-profit organisations to draw upon in making this synthesis to work out whether, in fact, that was the case. So that's one national experiment that I think was a complete failure. And, and right holders have pointed to that and said, well, look, it's uncertain. People aren't using it because it's, it's too uncertain. But I think uh, you can design flexibilities that achieve their ends much better than uh, that particular experiment managed. And Albert, and then Karen. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, it's interesting the difference between uh, talking about copyright issues in Latin America and talking about the copyright issues in, in the U.S. because here we are focusing on users like and to some extent how it can improve uh, opportunities for innovation. Uh, in Latin America, the, the, the situation is much more difficult, more, more, more different. I will say that actually copyright, instead of promoting uh, innovation, punish innovation. Uh, why I say that? You can explain that for two reasons. One at the theoretical level, copyright regulation in Latin American country is not drafted with the idea of balancing progresses with protection, but it's drafted with the French idea that we are protecting creators. And that provides a broader uh, protection to copyright. So innovation is not an issue in the copyright law in Latin America. And the second is because in, in normative terms, all countries punish infringement. And infringement is any usage that is not allowed by copyright, uh, copyright holders or the law. The law forbids most uh, of the usage, not only for commercial or for profit, but also for non-commercial and non-profit. Therefore, the opportunities to take advantage of copyright as a user to innovate are much more smaller than in, than in the U.S. I, I, I am not kidding about that, but copyright in Latin American countries punish, punishes innovators. They don't provide, it doesn't provide any room for innovation. And sorry, and, and another, another point about the statistical uh, opportunities to, to, to work in Latin American issues or uh, to do empirical studies on, on this matter. I will say that it's not only that, that we, we talk more about theoretical terms about the f social function of property and particularly copyright, but to be honest, developing countries, it's really hard to work with statistical or with empirical data in developing countries. I have been working the last three years trying to collect information about copyright issues in Latin America, and I have found information only in two uh, niches. The first one is co criminal co copyright enforcement. That's why. Why is that? Uh, basically because in the last 10 years, Latin American countries have been moving from an inquisitorial system of uh, criminal justice to an adversarial one. So there is a lot of empirical studies on criminal enforcement in Latin America, and certainly you can find on enforcement in copyright, particularly in Chile, Mexico, and Argentina. Uh, and the second area where you can find uh, empirical uh, data, factual data, empirical data uh, through the time is in the book market. And to, to, to which extent countries are producing, buying, selling, using uh, um, uh, books and publishing material. But in areas like music, the data is totally opaque. In areas like software, it doesn't exist. In, like, in areas like video game, it doesn't exist. So one of the problems that why Latin American copyright reform is standing by the, the perspective of human rights, social fusion of the property, is basically because we don't have data. Thank you. Okay, I just wanted to hark back to your question, Mike, um, about if we think about exceptions and limitations as enabling provisions, um, what kind of empirical research would we need to um, support a case for meaningful exceptions and limitations. And I think that um, in the Global South, we need to prioritize um, the Global South's own priorities. So for example, in South Africa, no one cares very much about file sharing of copyright infringement um, music. It's, it's not high on government priorities. But if you cast your arguments and your empirical evidence within the framework of, I suppose, access to learning materials, for example, that would be much more 
um, credit worthy, I think. And so I would say that um, we, those of us who are able to carry out these studies need to focus in those contexts, and that would be most meaningful, I think. Great. Can I invite the audience now to uh, ask a few questions? And uh, please do use the mic and identify yourself. <laughs> um, and we are recording this, so just be comfortable with that fact. <laughs> Uh, my name is Elliot Maxwell, and I'm going to speak a little bit about a piece of evidence that Mike uh, knows well uh, that's not specifically focused on copyright, but I think can be extrapolated very, very easily into the discussions that you're having now. It deals with the issues of, the open, of public access to uh, taxpayer-funded research, and in particular, the uh, uh, policy of the NIH to make that research available. The Committee for Economic Development did a study of the effect of that policy, uh, which went into effect in 2008, published in a study in uh, 2012, that looked at the implications of making that uh, material available. It was specifically not uh, a copyright issue because the publishers which had, who had originally sought to make it a copyright issue decided that was not a particularly strong card to play because the government had, as part of its grant processes, said that there was an obligation on the grantees to make the material available at the time of publication. But the study looked at a series of uh, economic studies that looked at the effect of sharing of research material on either academic citations, but more importantly, on both further research and commercialization. The gold standard of, that, of those set of studies is one done by Heidi Williams at MIT, who looked at the uh, Human Genome Project. And she looked at it in comparing two different models. One was Solera, which was a company that was doing research to decode the genome and would rent out its uh, uh, research results, but would not make them public, versus the Human Genome Project, which said all of the findings should be placed in the gene bank and would be made available immediately. And what she did was to compare two things as a result of this research. Uh, one was the links between decoding the genome and establishing the phenotypes, those kinds of uh, conditions which were related to the genetic condition, and then the development of commercial tests which would test for the genotype-phenotype link. And economic uh, intellectual property theory, as cited by the publishers and others, would say that the parties that had early access to the data, that would be renting it from Solera, that had a head start, because they were not getting it at the same time as everybody else, should have developed diagnostic tests more quickly than those people who were starting at the same time as everybody else with exactly the same data as everybody else. But the availability of the material more broadly led to a 30 percent increase in both detection of genotype-phenotype links and development of commercial tests, the theory being that more people pursuing different paths of research from this material led to faster development of commercial tests. So this is a kind of classic economic test of what's the economic value of access. And all of the issues of limitations and exceptions, if one takes the, what Mike was just suggesting about enabling, is to say that greater access leads, leads to more people pursuing more different kinds of research, different paths of tests, and greater economic growth and development. There were other, other studies that were found in, in that study, the mega study of the report. They all have, most studies have this difficulty that people have pointed out repeatedly about having, not having a starting point and an ending point, a beginning to which one can compare and not. But there's at least one other uh, study that had a beginning and an end uh, by Fiona Murray at MIT, which compared transgenic mice in the 90s, which were used for cancer treatment. 
and they eventually there was a start to these studies and there was an end to these studies and the results were very similar to what was later found by Fiona Murray which is that people who used mice that were available for more different ways of studying produced research that was cited more often and moved closer to commercialization than studies where the uses were restricted by licensing. So there is that and there is a third study to call to your attention which will be published shortly which has just been done comparing um, 44 medical journals in the United States and abroad and materials that were open within these journals and patent applications in the period 2005 to 2012. And the results of this study is that those articles that were open led to a 30 percent increase in the likelihood that they would be cited in patent applications than articles that were not available by via open access. And the economic literature tends to take patent applications and patent grants as a surrogate for both innovation and economic growth. This report looks very carefully at all patent applications using the 44 leading journals and again what you see is things being more open led to uh, results which suggest greater innovation and greater economic growth. So it may be worth thinking about I, uh, the surrogates for issues about exceptions or limitations using open access as a, as a surrogate for the results of those parts of copyright law. Great. Thanks. Uh, sir. My name is Austin Isfandiari. I'm with Telespheres. And just to, I guess, follow up on that question is we're talking about copyright here today and the sister or brother of that would be patents. And um, my question is, is the problem with patents very similar and on the same track with copyright problems? Or is it completely different? If so, why and how so? Thank you. Let's just take them all since we're going to take a break, and then we'll uh, pick and choose as we can. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, uh, I'm Jonathan Band. Um, and from a very high level, it seems that um, to some extent there's a – one of the problems here is that a lot of what we were, we're talking about both in the previous panel and this panel is sort of uh, as a, on, a, on a practical level is responding to the studies done by the content industries that, uh, you know, who, who, who – studies that have virtually no validity. And part of the problem is, 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 as academics, you have to be intellectually honest. And your response to those dishonest studies is to say, well, we need to construct honest studies. We need to think of how would we really demonstrate what is the impact of copyright uh, on uh, economic growth and so forth. But, you know, and, and we've seen that that's a very hard thing to really study. Um, and that suggests to me that maybe rather than sort of just saying, okay, well, how do we come up with better evidence? Uh, how do we come up with better studies to solve this very difficult problem? Because we believe that those other studies have no validity. It, it seems that a very important service is to simply focus on debunking those other studies. Now, to some extent, that's a trivial exercise. You know, any economics graduate student, you know, in 15 minutes can tell you, point out 15 different things. But still, it would be very powerful whenever one of these uh, bogus industry studies come out, if a bunch of economists come together and say, okay, this latest study is, you know, has no validity for the following five reasons, but do it in two pages and not in a long economic paper. I mean, I think that that would have uh, uh, you know, the debunking is not to be trivialized and may have more impact than a very complex economic study that is better designed but then may lead to inconclusive results. Secondly, um, I, I think it's, uh, uh, and this, you know, this picks up from uh, Jennifer's point and I think also Alan's point is, is one should not overlook the importance of anecdotal evidence. I mean, anecdotal evidence is enormously influential 
uh, and Jennifer sort of talked about how you know we can see that clearly in uh, uh, you know j judicial uh, decisions. Um, but you, you can also, and that doesn't mean that there's no role for economists. I Meaning, I think even in developing good anecdotal evidence, or, you know, really good anecdotal evidence has a lot of quantitative basis. You want to get the numbers right in those anecdotes, and a lot of that would involve, you know, maybe it's microeconomists rather than macroeconomists, but it does involve econ economic analysis of, of data to come up with you know, the good anecdotes and to come up with the numbers that show why this is a compelling story. And just to close, I mean, there is no better example, you know, in, in the various sort of lobbying I've done, you know, in, in, in TPP and other contexts, you know, when, the, when people say, well, tell me why fair use is important or, or show me why fair use is important, all I have to do is say Google, okay? and explain to them why Google is all based on fair use. And, and you have $150 billion of market value based on fair use. And once you sort of explain that to them, that's important. Now, where the economists could come in is to, you know, be able to demonstrate what is the economic value and, and everything that flows from something like Google. But the anecdote of Google is enormously important for fair use. Just one other quick example on, on you know, uh, uh, Brandon and I have been working uh, in put together uh, an article that just sort of has all these anecdotes, all the horror stories of collecting societies around the world. You know, that, and I think that even that can be expanded and more stories can be added and, you know, you can drill down on any, you know, on certain collecting societies and the numbers of the, you know, what, what are their, the economics of that society, you know, where the money comes in, where does it go out, what happens to it. but. Again, those, those stories, those looking at that anecdotal evidence in, in close detail can be very powerful in uh, uh, really promoting uh, uh, exceptions and limitations. Thanks. We call that qualitative evidence, if it's done as fully as you were describing, I think. Yes, we hope for good qualitative evidence too, uh, yeah. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, Mora Degbal, uh, previously at the University of Baltimore Center for International Comparative Law, now with uh, Plasma Technologies LLC. The, the comment or the observation or question I have is if we characterize the entire copyright regime globally as on the one end either punitive because it wants to prevent violation and protect the originator and on the other side permissive because it wants to help with growth and development. Uh, in your mind's eye, if you had a choice to bring suit in either a permissive or a, or a punitive system, what choices would you make? It's a generalization to be sure, but I'm trying to test the two ends of that spectrum. And if you can fold into that, any observations you wish to put in with regard to what kind of evidentiary basis do you have to bring to that task? I mean, a lot of it we've talked about is electronic and maybe not in book form. Uh, codes of evidence are very different in different regimes. So if you can say something about that on the practicality side of it, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Great. So quick reactions since we are mindful of time, but bid in. So Martin. Sure. Um, I have a quick comment on the first question. Is it really um, relevant whether it's patent law or copyright law? Well, the answer from um, at least a European perspective is, well, there is a conceptual difference. Um, unlike the U.S., we don't have a general clause saying for the progress of science and the arts. So um, the basis for patent law is clearly a utilitarian one, that you want to um, incentivize uh, new technical solutions. Whereas, and Alberto uh, mentioned that also earlier, in the area of copyright, there is still a very strong foundation based on personality rights, which would see copyright as a kind of absolute right following from the idea that the work is a materialization of the personality of the individual author. And this would mean that you don't have this idea of um, achieving a greater societal goal. Um, the idea is much more clear-cut and simple. You want maximal, maximal protection for something that belongs to the individual author because of the link with his or her 
personality. So um, if you follow this theoretical line of argument, there's a true difference. Having said that, we see that there's a move in the European Union discourse even to the more utilitarian view asking what is the final result for society. You see that clearly in the recitals of um, copyright legislation at EU level. So I think even um, in, in this area where we traditionally have the difference between um, different theoretical approaches, we see a move to um, questions that can be posed in the same way in the area of patent law and copyright law. So it's, it's getting more equal also in that sense. And then um, the, the final question on how to bring um, a lawsuit in a permissive or a punitive system. I think um, um, the difference for uh, the claimant is not so obvious. I mean, you, you, you just argue your case, so you, you provide the evidence for infringement. The difference is rather on the side of the defendant. Can the defendant bring arguments based on general policy arguments, like saying, well, okay, um, if, if we look at it, um, as, as a static um, act I have done, then it is an infringing act. But listen, there we, we have to include second thoughts. Like this is something that is very important for, I don't know, innovation, social, cultural, economic purposes. So uh, basically the evaluation, the assessment that is finally made by the judge gets a more balanced one. Whereas in a purely punitive system, um, you have more the the automated result that you bring a claim, you argue your case, and then it's infringement. And if uh, you can't provide a defense on the basis of a closed list of exceptions and limitations, then that's end of the story, regardless of whether or not you have some very good reason for um, getting involved in the use you are carrying out. Jeremy and Rebecca, and then we're going to have to cut it off. In so I'll just be really brief then. I think um, uh, our last panel talked already about the methodological differences between users' rights or limitations and exceptions in copyrights uh, versus patents, and most of that revolves around the availability of data. But I would add to that a normative distinction, and that's the simple fact that copyright can last for a century and a half when a patent lasts for 20 years. And the vast majority, well, what's the vast majority? That's an empirical question, but a lot of uh, 20th century uh, culture is protected by copyright because you don't need to register it. So I think there's both a methodological and a, a normative distinction between uh, limitation and sections uh, in patents and copyrights. I just want to make a very quick uh, counterpoint to Martin's perspective that uh, utilit uh, utilitarian uh, is becoming more influential in the, the traditionally natural right jurisdictions. I'm really feeling in the utilitarian jurisdictions, it's going the other way. Like so often we're hearing these arguments that reduced infringement should be an aim of copyright in and of itself, regardless of whether it achieves any of the underlying cultural aims of encouraging the most widespread creation and dissemination of data. So I think the point that was made earlier that there's not such a big distinction um, between these two traditions is exactly right because we're coming I think the economic studies also we could face, which I haven't really seen one, on how much the states uh, have to spend, how much it costs enforcement as a whole. That's another thing to see if it's worth enforcement or just open up the systems. I haven't really seen that much of that. Okay, if we could please give our panel a hand. Uh, <laughs> we are, we are, the, the busy law school that we are, this room is booked uh, immediately after us, so we need, do need to start the keynote roughly on time, which means our longer break that was scheduled is now a short, uh, quick break to take care of necessary things, and then please rejoin us um, at 5.35 so we can get started and give Sunil his full time.
like, just do this, here's the road, right? So it's almost like...
Okay, so we're, we're going to um, conclude by inviting uh, Sunil Abraham to have a few words with us, um, just by way of, of brief uh, introduction. So Sunil is the Executive Director on the Center of Internet and Society, with Pidgeup has been working with uh, for many years. It's located in, in Bangalore, in India. Um, he's also the, the founder in, in 1998 of Mahiti, which is a high-tech firm that employs about 50 engineers and does communications and technology work. He's an Ashoka and a Floss Fellow and a former manager for the UNDP uh, Open Source Network. And we're very happy to have Sunil join us today. And so please take us up. Uh, good evening. I'll start with a couple of apologies. Uh, the first is I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, <laughs> the, the second is that it is 3 a.m. in Bangalore. So if, so if I don't make uh, much sense, I hope you'll forgive me. I'm also not a lawyer, so please don't ask me any tough questions. <laughs> Uh, the work I'm presenting is not my own, so I'll give uh, credit to those who did all the work. Uh, Amba Kak, Neha Chowdhury, Puneet Nagraj, and Gavin Pereira. In my presentation that will focus mostly on innovation in the telecom sector in India, uh, I will touch upon consumer protection law, uh, compulsory licenses both for copyright and patents, and also royalty caps. I don't know if royalty caps is a common policy instrument across other jurisdictions. Uh, I will begin with the content layer on these devices, uh, but first sketch a little bit the overall scenario in India. In a country with 1.3 billion people, uh, only 10% has access to the Internet. Only 5% of this 10% have regular access to the Internet. The other five uh, are people that visit cyber cafes and also users that have accessed a single data service through their mobile phones. This is including activities such as downloading ringtones or music onto a non-smartphone. Uh, the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India says that there are 900 million subscribers 
uh, but that translates only to 600 million users of mobile phones in the country. Uh, about 150 million phones are sold every year, and only 10% of these phones are smartphones. The rest are what we call feature phones. Uh, the first finding, and this is uh, research conducted by Amba Kak, a Google fellow based at my center, is that rights holders are competing with pirates on exactly the same price point. There are uh, five ways you can legally access music on a phone. The first is online streaming. This obviously works only on smartphones. This is ad supported and is completely free of cost. Uh, the second is online music store. Again, this works only on smartphones. And the price point varies from 1 to 15 uh, rupees per song. So that's 2 cents uh, to about 25 cents per song, depending on which store you go to. Uh, the song available for 2 cents comes with DRM, and uh, the songs available for 25 cents comes without DRM. Uh, the third uh, option is bundled music store. This was launched by Nokia. If you bought a Nokia handset, then it also came with a package deal uh, which allowed you to access a music catalog. It was free for the first year, and from the second year onwards, it was $1.5 a year, a month, sorry. And the main channel for music access on mobile phones in India, including uh, feature phones, is what we call VAS music, or value added services music. Uh, and on this uh, platform, a single song costs two cents. This is exactly the same price point uh, if you were to access music illegally on your phone in India. Illegal access uh, to music on your phone meant two things, because most of the mobile phone users don't have access to the internet, so they're unable to torrent music themselves and then transfer it onto their phones. It meant that you go either to the person repairing your mobile phone, and they will show you their catalog and allow you to copy 100 or 200, perhaps even 500 songs onto your uh, phone or device for about two cents per track. And the innovation in India, which I doubt occurs in many other jurisdictions, is what we call mobile chip piracy. So you go to a vendor, the same vendor that sells you illegal DVDs and CDs, and he is also selling you a mobile phone memory card, which is preloaded with content. This is very popular in second tier cities and is the primary source of circulation of non-mainstream music. So the Indian music industry estimates that they lose about $65 million every year to mobile chip piracy. Uh, however, the size of the legal market is also quite large. Uh, the overall revenue for the vast industry every year is about $4.3 billion. Uh, there are varying estimates of how much of this is music. But we know for sure that at least $1 billion is music annually on this platform. This includes everything, the full MP3, ringtones, and callback tunes. This billion dollars is split rather unequally. Uh, there are several players in between the record label and the user. So the user pays the telco, who pays the value-added services provider, who pays the content aggregator, and finally the record label gets paid. And, mus and music comes the other way, or content comes in the opposite direction. So the telco keeps the giant share, which is 65% of this billion dollar pie. Uh, the vast operator gets 10%, the, 
the content aggregator gets 10% and 15% is given to the government as tax. Uh, what we found in the research is that the whole system is filled with pervasive fraud at all levels. There is business to business fraud and also business to consumer fraud. So the $65 million figure is what the rights holders are complaining about. They are saying that consumers are ripping us off for $65 million. But let's find out how much businesses are ripping off consumers. Uh, the business to business fraud is mostly underreporting and false reporting, uh, refusing to identify content through metadata, etc. And the business to consumer fraud is of three types. Subscribing consumers to services that they didn't ask for, uh, renewing services without checking with consumers, and the third type is straightforward billing fraud. That means uh, false items on your bill with no relationship either to any service that you have subscribed to, just false billing mostly happening at the telco level. So the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India decided to work on this, and this is where the consumer law kicks in. Uh, they started by blacklisting VAS operators. But the VAS operators uh, re-emerged under new brands under the same holding company. So that didn't work. In July 2012, uh, the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India said that if a VAS service has to be initiated or renewed, then the consumer must confirm or consent via SMS, email, or fax. The fax bit, of course, I don't understand, because most of these consumers have no access to fax. Uh, this turned to be a bit too stringent, because most Indian consumers also don't use SMS. So they relaxed the guidelines in July this year, and they said that consumers must subscribe twice uh, to the same service. They must go through the subscription process twice, and then that is taken as a legitimate subscription of service or a legitimate renewal of service. This led to, almost within the next three, four months, a 60% shrinkage in the consumer base and an even larger shrinkage in revenues. So if you calculate this back onto the billion dollars, uh, this is about... Uh, anywhere from 300 million to 600 million dollars of fraud annually conducted upon consumers uh, with several parties working together in collusion, rights holders, content aggregators, and technical intermediaries. So in order to protect user rights, you don't always have to look at intellectual property law. As Jeremy Malcolm has adequately demonstrated through his research, often consumer law is a better place to start when you are protecting uh, consumer rights. Sideloading license. This is an another innovation that started in India in 2009 that tried to legitimize the pirate activity happening with both mobile chip piracy and loading of content by those repairing mobile phones. We have three such licenses in India today, and they range from about $185 to $370 annually per shop, regardless of how many consumers they have and regardless of how many uh, of the volume of music transferred onto these devices. Uh, the first license is called the MMX license. And it was launched in 2009. Seven labels in four states, four North Indian states. Uh, the second license is called the Hangama license, launched by T-Series. T-Series holds 70% of the Hindi music catalog, 
if you've ever watched an uh, Indian movie, you will realize that music is a very important component of our culture. Uh, and the third license is the Cell Music License, launched by Simca. This is the South Indian Music Producers Association, uh, and it is mostly for the South Indian uh, states. Uh, this has been relatively successful. The MMX license reported $2 million of revenue last year. What this does is it legitimizes an illegal activity in the market without shifting the price point. So even after the mobile phone repair shop subscribes to one of these licenses, they don't increase the price point. They keep the price point at two cents, but now it is a semi-legal operation. Semi-legal because consumers' tastes are quite varied, and often there is music at this shop's catalog or in this shop's catalog that is not represented by uh, the license uh, provider. And when police raid an operation, often the owner of the shop will show one such license, but this does not necessarily mean that they have rights to distribute North Indian music or South Indian music or even non-mainstream non music. Uh, there is technical innovation happening here. Uh, at the moment, some of the technical intermediaries are working on software that will allow the rights holders to more closely track and monitor which tracks are being downloaded and used so that uh, royalty can be split more accurately across copyright societies and artists. So this is just a voluntary measure, not taking advantage of uh, a provision in law. The trust deficit, because of pervasive fraud, as I said earlier, everybody is ripping off somebody in the value chain. Telcos are defrauding the vast platforms, who in turn are defrauding the content aggregators, who in turn are defrauding the record labels. Because of the pervasive uh, trust deficit, there has been a rise in what we call technical intermediaries. One more uh, point in the, in the chain. Uh, in, in 2011, one such technical intermediary became rather popular. Uh, this was a company called Mime360. They represented 40 to 45 percent of the rights holders, and except for two of the bigger players in the VAS market, all the other VAS providers and online platforms signed up with the technical intermediary. So by allowing for greater monitoring, they're hoping to address the trust deficit. Because the trust deficit existed, uh, rights holders were refusing to license their content on a usage basis they were insisting on something called a minimum guarantee. This was an annual upfront payment. And the annual upfront payment was uh, around $300,000 a year. The moment Mine360 was introduced and rights holders got a sense of what the actual consumption value, uh, volume was, instead of shifting to a pay-per-use type licensing mechanism, they just multiplied the minimum guarantee by f f 5 or 10, taking minimum guarantees up to 3 to $1.5 million a year. Then MIME 360 had to shut down, uh, and the whole system uh, collapsed. Now, another online intermediary is setting up one such technical platform. Uh, this is going to be called Atlantis. And the only reason why uh, the record labels are trusting this platform is because the person heading the project comes uh, from uh, their industry. So one wonders uh, whether this has a key person problem. What happens if this person is run over by a bus? Maybe that platform will also collapse. 
the extremely high minimum guarantees have meant that most VAS providers and online service providers of music are going out of business. So they are wondering if they should apply for a compulsory license. Uh, the Indian copyright law allows, uh, potentially can allow for such a license. Uh, the grounds in the law state, owner of copyright has refused to allow communication to the public by broadcast of such works on terms which the complainant considers reasonable. Uh, of course, the key word here is broadcast. And since online services can be both interactive and non-interactive, the question before uh, the Copyright Board will be whether interactive services also count as broadcast to the public. Uh, after the 2012 amendment to the law, uh, the Indian Copyright Law requires copyright societies to publish their tariff schemes publicly, and any person aggrieved by the tariff scheme may appeal to the Copyright Board to remove any unreasonable element, anomaly, or inconsistency therein. So it, they have basically strengthened uh, the compulsory license provision. Even though we do have a compulsory license provision in the letter of the law, it has almost never been used. The first license uh, was applied for in 2001 when radio stations, FM radio stations, approached the Copyright uh, Board complaining that the music labels were charging too much. Uh, the Copyright Board spent two years thinking it through and then arrived at an interim decision. Immediately this was challenged in the Mumbai and Delhi High Courts. It finally reached the Supreme Court of India, which referred the matter back to the Copyright Board. The Copyright Board in 2008 uh, uh, started hearing the matter again, and in 2010 gave a final decision, which is 2% of net advertising revenue. That was uh, far too low uh, in retrospect and did not adequately differentiate between time zone, markets, types of radio stations, etc. But uh, this is, uh, the story is very similar to the grant of the first uh, compulsory license under patent for Nexaware. So you know that uh, the Controller General for Patents, Designs, Trademarks and Industrial Designs uh, granted the first Indian compulsory license on a patent in medicine three days before his term expired to prevent uh, any rollback through political pressure. And even with the first copyright compulsory license issued by the Copyright Board, overnight all the, uh, the decision was emailed, perhaps for the first time, to all uh, parties involved. And the <coughs> uh, Registrar for Copyrights issued licenses to all the FM radio stations that night without going home to prevent uh, further litigation on the matter. So even though user rights may be enshrined in the text of law, sometimes it's rather complicated to exercise those rights. Um, we spoke to some government officials who, of course, refused to be named. What is strange about this study is nobody is willing to be named. We spoke to officials in the American government also involved in collecting societies here, even they refused to be quoted or named in our study. So it's not specifically an Indian problem. Uh, the official said that the copyright provision uh, could be exploited by both interactive and non-interactive uh, mobile services, mobile and internet service providers. So there is potentially hope uh, because uh, these intermediaries need to be protected Otherwise, the record labels are not going to work on making their music available on the mobile phone or through the Internet. Uh, I will end with Amba's study here. Uh, I will just touch upon briefly the potential for a similar study on video. 
uh, though we have done no work at all on it. I went to the neighboring uh, cyber cafe and there I saw the cyber cafe owner was downloading uh, Hindi and South Indian cinema and then compressing the, uh, the files he downloaded to a much smaller size. He had very sophisticated compression software. So I asked him what he was doing. So apparently there is a similar sideloading uh, phenomenon for videos. Uh, many people who live in slums uh, and who are not happy with what they have on television just lie in bed and on their really small mobile phone screens with earphones watch movies, full length movies on uh, the mobile platform. Uh, since this is not a large scale phenomena, we still haven't launched any research on it, but I'm sure this is going to be equally interesting research. Uh, moving, moving on to uh, patents, uh, I've told the Spice Popcorn story before, so I don't want to repeat it. I'll tell another story about uh, one of the five largest IT companies in India. Uh, that company is sitting on a $25 billion cash reserve, and that's rather tempting to rights holders across the globe. A large multinational company with a very big uh, patent portfolio, perhaps the biggest in the world. Uh, representatives from their patent team gets on a private jet and they land in Bangalore airport. And then they send a message to the CEO of the large Indian IT company saying that we'd like to have, uh, we've just arrived on our private jet and we'd like to have audience with you. So the CEO is obviously flattered and he calls them in. And when they meet him, they say that we have a quarterly target to raise revenues from our patent portfolio. This is uh, 14 of our patents that your product, and as you know, Indian software companies usually don't have products, but some of them are slowly beginning to transition from services to products. Uh, they say that your product is infringing these 14 patents, and we want... $50 million for a five-year license or something like that. So you would think that this is hardly anything for a company that's sitting on a $25 billion ca cash pile. But uh, when the negotiations begin, what the multinational company with the large patent portfolio says is, just imagine if news goes out that uh, both of us are engaged in patent litigation what will happen to your share value? So that becomes the clinching argument, and all five pay regularly. So this is an annual phenomenon. Every year, the plane comes again, a different company is targeted, and uh, they pay. So I'm hoping that uh, more and more Indian companies will begin to have a public policy stance on uh, patents. But our business is mostly, our research is mostly focused on uh, the mobile phone. The problem statement is that voluntary pools and licensing is not reducing uncertainty for manufacturers. As you know, on the LTE standard, there are four pools. Even if you license into one pool, you're not protected from litigation from any of the other rights holders. Section 84 of the Indian Patent Act says that any interested party can approach the Controller General for Patents, Designs and Trademarks and the grounds are failure to meet reasonable requirement of the public with reference to the invention. That's ground one. Two, unavailability of the patented invention, and this is important, at a reasonable, affordable price to the public. So it's not a reasonable, affordable price in the RAND French sense to the manufacturer. It should be reasonable to the public. And uh, this is a public that pays only $100 for a smartphone. The third ground is non-working of the patented invention in the territory of India. Uh, the first 
Compulsory license was granted and upheld by the Intellectual Property Appellate Board in March 2013, and this is for next surveyor. Uh, Bayer, of course, has said that they're going to appeal the decision. They're going to take it through the courts. Uh, to take this research forward, uh, we have a collaboration with IIT Madras. Uh, Professor Junjunwala is an advisor to the Indian government and also serves on the Telecom Standards Development Organization. And he has asked us to do work on LT Release 12. So we went and spoke to some of the manufacturers of LT infrastructure equipment. This is backhaul gear. And they told us that you don't have to worry about standard essential patents. That was news to me. I thought if we are going to approach the Controller General and ask for a compulsory license on the patents related to the LTE standard, Release 12, then we should ask for a compulsory license on all standard essential patents. Uh, the vendor says that that's not important. He introduced a new term to my dictionary, and he calls them seminal patents. So this is a subset of the standard essential patents around which there has been litigation. That means or around which uh, royal, uh, royal, royalty negotiations have been conducted. This means that the rights holder is relatively sure of uh, the claims made in that patent application. Uh, which also means that many of the so-called standard essential patents are not standard essential at all. Uh, in order to give this a public interest twist, uh, we can't just limit it to those patents that are useful on the infrastructure side. We'd also have to go for those patents that have to be worked on the device end. Uh, we are now uh, reaching out to these manufacturers, and some of them have agreed uh, to share their uh, landscaping, pat patent landscaping data with us. Uh, this is because the patent wars on the mobile device have finally come to India. Uh, earlier this year, Ericsson took Micromax to court over 14 patents, Unfortunately, this is still not in the public domain, so we don't know uh, what those 14 patents are about. And uh, as an interim settlement encouraged by the court, Micromax has agreed to pay Ericsson 100 crores. 100 crores is uh, about 20, 20 million dollars as an interim uh, payment before, but the case continues. Micromax then uh, complained to the Competition Commission uh, saying that uh, interim, asking for an interim injunction against the distribution and uh, sale of these devices amounts to anti-competitive behavior. And the Competition Commission has invited uh, my center to comment on uh, this case that the Commission is now going to investigate. Uh, unfortunately, since we don't know what the patents are, it's very difficult to comment. Uh, if we manage to get this through, uh, since both the infra manufacturers and the device manufacturers are willing to take the application for the compulsory license to the Controller General, uh, then we could potentially get even more ambitious. Uh, my dream would be to have a device level patent pool for all uh, sub-$100 devices. This is because the Indian government has been promoting a sub-$100 or a sub-$50 tablet called the Akash tablet. And that tablet, as far as I'm concerned, infringes on many patents. So it's illegal in some sense. So in order to make one of their pet projects successful, uh, we are hoping that they will bite such an, uh, an idea. Uh, hopefully we will get the Ministry for Human Resource Development uh, to file for the compulsory license. Uh, the complications are, especially in India, that 
the manufacture does not really happen in India. Uh, it's a very long and complicated story. Uh, it starts off in Taiwan at a company called MediaTek that produces the kit. This is the chip, the board, and the antenna. Then that is transferred to Shenzhen, where the rest of the phone is put together. The so-called mobile phone manufacturers of India, this is Lava, Micromax, Spice, uh, Carbon, all they do is take a plane uh, and go to Shenzhen with a USB drive with their logo on it. Once they reach a factory in Shenzhen, they are given a menu card of options that they can choose. So for the Spice Popcorn M9000, all Spice does is says, pick a projector, yes, uh, a dual SIM card, yes, a receiver for terrestrial television, yes, a receiver for FM radio, yes, a tripod stand, yes, a LED based torch, yes, um, external speakers, yes, and then for about $100, that device can be uh, sold in India. So, and it usually takes about 45 days or 50 days for the uh, factories in Shenzhen to actually produce these devices. There is uh, the phenomena of Shenzhai, which, of course, we have not researched, but this is possible, this rate of innovation is possible in Shenzhen because during the day, the very same factories make devices for BlackBerry and uh, Apple and other uh, global brands, and, and they informally share the bill of materials amongst each other, and therefore for the Indian companies, they're able to pack all the innovation into a single device. Uh, if you register a patent in India, uh, the patent office requires that you annually file a form about the working of the patent, including details about the royalty you receive from entities that are allowed to work the patent in India. So we looked at all of uh, uh, some of Qualcomm's filings, and it was very interesting to see that some of these factories in China and Taiwan were listed on that filing as a license to work the patent for a sale in India. That means we don't have to worry about those patents when we assemble the pool in India and when we ask for a compulsory license on the pool. Uh, this makes the research project even more complicated. And the uh, next complication, perhaps the final complication is many of the patents for the features on the phone are not even registered in India. So if you take uh, a feature like the battery, in the U.S. Patent Office, there may be 200 or 300 patents connected to the battery. But in India, that would be just 10 or 20 patents. So uh, we need to look uh, through the filings in the Indian Patent Office very, very carefully. Um, I'll end by talking about uh, royalty caps. In the year 1991, India earned $0.6 million from the intellectual property it licensed to foreigners. And for the intellectual property that it licensed from foreigners, India paid foreign entities uh, $49.5 million, about 50 times. Uh, what we earn is what we pay foreign entities. In 2010, what we paid rose to $2.4 billion, and what we earned was $60 million, roughly the same percentage. This does not include any copyright royalty, because copyright royalty is not reported to our central banks the same way as trademark royalty and patent royalty is reported. Till, that, till 2009, we had something called a royalty cap that was put into place by the Reserve Bank of India. 
This royalty cap says that if it is meant for domestic sales and there is technology transfer, that means patented technologies, maximum royalty can be 5% of sales price. And if it's meant for foreign market, maximum royalty can be 8% of sales price. When there is no technology transfer, that means just trademark uh, implications, then uh, maximum royalty is 1% for domestic sales and 2% for foreign sales. Uh, this is precisely what allowed uh, Qualcomm uh, Reliance to negotiate royalty with Qualcomm uh, in the early 2000s. In the early 2000s, when uh, Reliance was launching CDMA phones in India, uh, Qualcomm insisted on 7% or 8% royalty for patents on the communication standards. But Reliance could say, this is illegal according to Indian law. Uh, we can pay only 5%. That's the maximum. Of course, as you know, there are potentially tens of thousands of patents in a mobile phone, and paying 5% just for the communication standard is not really uh, a proper implementation of the royalty cap. Ideally, the 5% should cover all patents. Uh, ever since the royalty cap was lifted in 2009, uh, there has been dramatic change. There was a government study of 20 companies and which, which found that royalty had tripled from 2008 to 2011. And very interestingly, uh, the chairman of ITC is one of the biggest companies in India, the, formerly the Indian Tobacco Company. Now they don't ex expand the acronym anymore because they're involved in almost everything. Uh, in his speech to the annual general assembly, an annual general meeting of the shareholders in July 2013, he quotes two uh, research findings. One by the Economic Times Intelligence Group that uh, looked at outgoing royalty and said that outgoing royalty had tripled in the last five years. And uh, 300 listed companies were now paying royalties of $3 billion annually. Remember in 2010, uh, the total bill for the whole country was only $2.4 billion. Now only the listed companies account for $3 billion. He also quoted a business standard research that said that 75 of the listed companies on the Bombay stock uh, exchange uh, paid 32% of their net profits as royalty. So royalty has dramatically increased. I'll uh, quote a line from his speech that shows you how intellectual property law also intersects with tax law. He says, since foreign brands entail a royalty outflow, a similar percentage of turnover of Indian brands should be admissible as deductible expense for the computation of corporate tax to create a level playing field for domestic enterprises. He's basically saying that foreign entities are able to extract royalty and the Indian subsidiary calls it an expense, therefore they don't pay tax on it either, so the government should give Indian competitors a similar tax break. As you all know, the Indian rupee has lost more than 10% against the dollar this year, and our current account deficit has grown to 4.8% of our GDP. So the Department of Industrial Policy and Planning is thinking of reintroducing the royalty cap. If they do, then negotiating a reasonable compulsory license on the LTE pool or the device level pool will become an easier task. Thank you so much. Uh, so I hope we can all agree that that was the best talk you've ever heard at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and, um, 
And I hope you can also agree why we invited Sunil to kind of cap off the day. This, this idea really came from the Global Congress last year, where at the end of a very long day of incredibly interesting talks, Sunil got up and kept everybody just really raptured with these stories of what's going on in intellectual property and technology in India. And so I know everybody is really dying to kind of jump into questions and answers and discussion, in which we are going to do, but we're going to do it Irish style, which means we're going to go over to room 600 and have beer. <laughs> so thank you very much.